Um, why don't we do a couple of quick introductions? Great. Great time. Want to go first? Great. Yeah. Hi, I'm Pete Kirby Miller. I'm a teacher naturalist here at North Branch Nature Center. A lot of the time I spend my time with students, elementary school students out in the woods, uh, learning about nature. But this time of year, I'm helping with the amphibian road crossing program. Uh, I have a background in ecology research, and it's fun to put on the scientist hat and the community science hat again this time of year. Uh, and I'm Sean. I'm the program director at the Nature Center and have been a uh, big fan of salamanders and frogs um, and early spring sightings for several years now. Um, it's really exciting to see how this program has grown over the last um, bunch of years. Um, many of you, uh, some of who I see in the list here have been um, rescuing salamanders and frogs from uh, the roadways for decades and have been uh, supporting the Nature Center in this work for a very long time. So thank you all. Um, so tonight we have kind of a two part program. Um, so first we're gonna really dive into amphibian ecology. Uh, and talk about who, who these critters are and what they're doing and why they're crossing the road this time of year. And um, then kind of part two is going to be uh, how we actually do the road crossing surveys and how we actually rescue the amphibians and why I'm holding a spatula and wearing a reflective vest and why you should be too. Um, and so, uh, so yeah, first up amphibian ecology and then uh, after that we'll get into the um, into the weeds and all the protocols and methods. But again, um, ask questions uh, in the chat for now. And uh, Pete, anything else before we kick things off? That sounds great. All right, here we go. All right, I'll start off with the ecology side of things. And these are our amphibians. These are our frogs, our toads, and our salamanders that bring us together today. And if you will inter uh, entertain me for just a second, let's go into the Greek, the etymology of amphibian. It comes from two Greek words, amphi meaning both and bios meaning lives, because these are creatures, amphibians, that have two lives. They have a life in the water and then they have a life back on land. And then in the spring, they go from the land back to the water. And we are most familiar with the terrestrial phase of amphibians, like this spotted salamander here. That is just a veritable dragon, the apex predator of the leaf litter, eating all sorts of snails and slugs and worms and being an absolute terror, being huge, really large animal for underneath the leaf litter. But when these salamanders are larvae, that's their uh, young aquatic phase, they're also really apex predators um, in, some of their best habitat. And they're surrounded by all sorts of different food opportunities. Copepods, amphipods, all sorts of uh, larvae of aquatic insects or the aquatic phase of flying insects. So these animals have adapted to really be like the top of the game at two different, really different points uh, in their life and different habitats. Uh, today, we're going to go through three different aspects of these amphibian lives. That's their general lives, how they migrate in the spring, and then their breeding biology in these pools and ponds. But first, let's think about where amphibians are right now. Or I have snow in this picture, which for most of the people here might not actually be out their window anymore. But about a week ago, there was snow out there. And before these warm spring rains we had last weekend, uh, it was covering most of the area. And below the snow, you actually, you hit the soil and then you run pretty directly into spring peepers and wood frogs and other frogs that go just barely underground uh, to overwinter. They aren't actually avoiding frost and freezing. Instead, they become uh, tolerant of it. They pump their bodies full of glycerols, and uh, different natural antifreezes, and they just freeze solid like an ice cube. Um, and those antifreeze chemicals uh, protect their cells from rupturing, uh, but otherwise they're frozen stiff um, in shallow soil and underneath leaves. The salamanders down in that left corner, 
have a different strategy. They really prefer to go far, far underground, often using the cracks around tree roots or rodent burrows to get below the frost, fine, frost line. If you put in um, like plumbing for a garden and you wanted to make it frost free, you know that you have to dig feet, feet below ground, three or four feet. Uh, and that's where these salamanders are living. And you can imagine that these different strategies uh, end up impacting when we might see them in the spring. As the snow melts and we get those warm rains, these uh, frogs that are just pumped full of antifreeze and are frozen as frog ice cubes sh under shallow soil, they're the first ones to thaw out. They can be much more sensitive than uh, the salamanders that are far, far below the ground um, and insulated by all that earth. Um, so it's often wood frogs and spring peepers in particular that you'll see returning to these breeding habitats this time of year. In fact, uh, now we have seven uh, data entries from the year 2022, uh, four of which have nothing in them. They have only zeros, which is fantastic data. Zeros are really important in ecological data. Knowing when things are not moving is a really great step towards knowing when things are moving. Um, and then we have three uh, data points that did record amphibians, and together they have four wood frogs and one spring peeper. So as we'd expect, those are the first things that we see this year. What towns are those in? Uh, Hartford, I think. Hartford. Um, and if you are listening and you submitted that and I did not credit you properly, I apologize. We're, uh, we're going to have many hundred more soon. Uh, but great. So let's first meet some characters here. We don't have time to talk about every amphibian that's known from Vermont. But we're going to focus on three characters. The first one is this, the spotted salamander, this most charismatic, largest of our salam salamanders, most charismatic in my opinion, and the opinion of all the people who put together promotional material because it ends up on they're just so photogenic. You can't blame them. They're absolutely adorable. They're really quite large. They're about the size of a Snickers bar and not like the fun size Snicker bar that you get when you're trick-or-treating. Well, I guess you could get a king size Snicker bar trick-or-treating, but that would be a phenomenal house not to miss any, uh, any other year. Uh, and they're, they have these really distinct uh, black skin with yellow spots on it um, that <laughs> seems really remarkably similar to uh, a black and yellow road. Um, but we'll see in a later photo that they can actually be kind of cryptic on, uh, they can blend in and have their outline break up on uh, the leaf litter. They're, they actually are pretty common uh, in the state. Uh, the conservation ranking is S5, least concern. Um, but we don't see them very often because they're what is uh, they're, they're in a group known as the mole salamanders. They spend almost all their time below the leaf litter or even below ground, but like where they're overwintering. Uh, so it's only in these special times of year when they're migrating across the road that they and people can intersect for a little while. Uh, so this is a really exciting time of year to see these truly fantastic, very cute uh, animals right outside our door. Next, we have the wood frog, uh, which is also a common animal. Um, and these are about the size of a Reese's peanut butter cup. Small ones can be like the ones that might be thrown out at a parade, where larger ones are king size Reese's peanut butter cups. Uh, they're brown to beige with a raccoon or bandit mask. And if you see running from the back of their eye to the back of their leg is what's called a dorsolateral ridge, this crease. That's also really indicative. They live in forests, they live in woods. Uh, as, as their name describes. Uh, and they, all, they have a really distinct, like almost duck quack sound. Um, and yeah, you might, these are one that you might see uh, a little more often. Um, they're very active at night, but they'll hop around during the day. Um, and since they aren't spending all their time underneath the leaf litter, you might come across them in the woods throughout the year. Our last character is the four-toed salamander, which isn't distributed entirely across Vermont. Uh, we don't have them in central Vermont here, but they are in the Champlain Valley and scattered throughout, you can see on that map. They're small, much, much smaller than our spotted salamander, only about the size of a pack of Smarties. Uh, and they have this rusty back with herringbone grooves and this really brilliant black and white spangled uh, side. 
Uh, and a really great characteristic for their identification is uh, you can see in that top view, right where their tail meets the rest of the body, there's often a notch. Um, and that's important to, that's a great field mark, uh, but it, it's also important to consider when you're handling them uh, because that notch is exactly the place where their tail might detach. Um, they have the ability to detach their tails uh, as a way to distract predators. So if a hungry raccoon or possum picked it up, they might detach their tail and then their tail squirms and wriggles around in a truly horrifying way. Um, if it happens to you, the salamander is gonna have a bad time, you're gonna have a bad time. It's really best to handle these really gently and never by the tail. Um, we'll go more into when and when not to handle a, a salamander later in the presentation. Sean will cover that. But this is one that if they're almost all the way across the road, it's a good good time to be like, okay, they got it. Um, because when they do drop that tail, it will grow back. The animal will survive, but it, it's a really big caloric expense. They need to eat a lot of small arthropods. They need to eat a lot of bugs. Uh, to gain back the calories of growing that tail. And in the meantime, while they're growing it back, they don't have that predator avoidance strategy. They can't drop a tail that's not there to distract a hungry possum. Uh, so let's go into where the spotted salamander is living. Like I said, it's nocturnal. And right now, or last week before they started to migrate in the lowest elevations of the Champlain Valley in southern Vermont, uh, they were underground in rodent burrows and root root channels. I think the ones right behind our house here are still underground in rodent burrows and root channels, but they might be moving soon. They're really widespread. Um, and if you were to find them uh, outside of the breeding season, under logs and rocks uh, would be the place to look. They have to stay moist. Uh, they breathe through their wet uh, skin, which is another important reason that we're going out to look for salamanders on big migration nights that are rainy. And like I said, they are strikingly colored with those yellow and black spots, but that can actually be kind of cryptic, kind of camouflaged on the really diversely colored um, leaf litter floor. Next, we have our wood frog. Um, they also are mostly nocturnal, but you'll come across them um, from time to time walking in the woods. They, are also easier to spot because uh, while a salamander might freeze uh, to try to hide from a predator, if you walk close to a frog, it might hop away and that draws your eye to, to the motion. Uh, they're found all throughout Vermont forests and they can be really camouflaged. That uh, dorsolateral ridge I was talking about, going from the eye to the back of the leg, really can mimic the midrib on, uh, on leaves on the forest floor. And you might see the motion of a wood frog jumping, but then once you zoom in and you look over there, it might take a while for you to find it. Uh, next, we have our four toe salamanders, which are also nocturnal. And outside of the Champlain Valley um, and some parts of the Connecticut River Valley and a few sites in the Upper Valley, um, they're pretty rare. Uh, they love forested, forested wetlands and they are more um, acid tolerant than um, our other amphibians. And that's uh, particularly important. Well, they're tolerant to like naturally occurring acidic soils. All amphibians are really highly sensitive to anthropogenic pollution, whether it's mercury deposition or chemical spills um, because they develop in the water and their skin is so permeable. Um, their entire body is covered in a mucous membrane. Um, they can be really like a first indicator, uh, like a canary in the coal mine for environmental pollution. But these four-toed salamanders are tolerant of acidic, naturally occurring acidic soils in Vermont. Uh, here are a couple photos of what great habitat for them looks like. Really ferny, wet, forested lands. Um, so yeah, returning to this, we're thinking about when uh, these animals might be migrating now. And it's those frogs that are coming out first um, and then often salamanders later. But there's a lot of overlap between the two groups. 
uh, as we migrate, those it's increasing soil temperature, air temperature, and melting snowpack and spring rains that all kind of combine into a messy area where a messy formula of when they might migrate. Um, folks might ask, ask people like us, do you think this will be a good migration night? And I think we're probably wrong more often than we're right. Um, sometimes we hit the nail on the head, but other times uh, the salamanders and the frogs have, well, you know, if they're not looking at the same forecast, we are. Um, and with like a weekend like we had in central Vermont this weekend, where it was in the 50s and 60s and raining, I thought that we wouldn't really be seeing, it's really quick. Um, it was cold and snowy the week before. There's some lag time associated with just getting all that heat and moisture down through all the soil. Uh, for anyone who has stored vegetables in a root cellar before, soil can be really insulating. Um, and it does take some time for those increased air temperatures to lead to increased soil temperatures. But those rains, especially those rains we had this weekend that soaked in, uh, might have really helped that to kick off migration the next time we have a warm spell. So spotted salamander migration is really well studied. While it can be hard to predict what it exactly is that causes them to migrate at a particular time, um, they have pretty tight home ranges. They'll spend all of their lives within just a couple hundred meters of one pond, and for the most part, return to that same breeding pool. So that offers an opportunity to really understand who's moving in and out and where they're living. And this 2009 study uh, tracked spotted salamanders and found that they generally, on average, travel about a quarter mile or more. But of course, some salamanders, those rare salamanders, uh, might choose to go to a breeding pool that they were born in, look around, and decide that it's not for them and move on. Um, and those are some that are really important for the, the overall genetic health of uh, of a population in, in a state or a region um, because they're carrying their genetic material from their natal pool, the pool they're bo born in, to a different one. So it might be tempting to see where the breeding pool is on a road and see a salamander going the wrong way and like, you know, turn it around. But it's actually really important to let those go because that can be one of those instances where you have a really important genetic uh, genetic spread event. Um, and yeah, so in this, this 2003 study, 90% of the spotted salamanders known from this one pool returned in just over five days. Like once they started going, they all started going. Um, evolutionary, this makes a lot of sense. If there's a male salamander in the pool and it's the first one there, uh, it doesn't have to compete with other male salamanders if they all stay underground. Um, so it's kind of like an all, they're all racing once, once uh, migration starts. And here we have a schematic, a beautiful photo of what good, although I'll say not great, uh, amphibian habitat looks like. There's forest above, right next to wetlands. And I say good, not great, because that wetland looks big enough to me that it doesn't dry up and it might have predaceous fish. Uh, salamanders, salamander in particular, but frogs as well, rely on finding places where they can be the big fish in the pond. Um, and a lot of times that means finding ponds that are small enough that they don't host fish uh, because it doesn't take that big of a fish to get a mouth that can go around a baby salamander, a baby frog and fish will love to eat just anything that fits in their mouths. Uh, so those star, star habitats of frogs, toads, and salamanders in the state are vernal pools. And those are, there are a lot of different definitions of them, but they generally converge on any pool, any small pool, a glor glorified puddle, or in my view, a glorious puddle uh, that uh, dries up at some point in the year or some point in most years. And that allows it to be free of predaceous fish. The fish can't survive it drying up. The salamanders and frogs can because by the time it dries up, they'll have metamorphosed 
grown their legs and crawled onto dry land. Uh, and this map here um, is drawn from the Vermont Center for Eco Studies Vernal Pool Atlas Project. They've gone through with some state resources and some remote sensing resources and mapped every potential um, every potential vernal pool in the state, every known vernal pool in the state. And then also they've recorded whether people have visited it and confirmed it either by hydrology or biology that it's a vernal pool. Um, and if you're so excited to see um, amphibians at all phases of their life, it's really great to plug in with Vermont Center of Eco Studies. They have both this vernal pool atlas and a vernal pool monitoring program where you can see salamander and frog eggs and larva um, and all of the different ecology that happens in vernal pools. Um, this is what a vernal pool might look like uh, now. I think we're at about the second photo from the left. Two, three weeks ago is the furthest left. Soon we'll be have all of the ice melted. And by the end of the summer, these puddles dry up almost entirely. And I think it, yeah, there are quite often reports of frogs, spring peepers, and uh, wood frogs returning to vernal pools while there's still ice on it. It's much, much less common um, to see salamanders doing that. The uh, Jefferson salamander, which is one that is uh, tends to be found a little bit higher elevation than others. The Jefferson salamanders, folks will often see them moving across the snow to get into a vernal pool that has just barely uh, begun to unfreeze. So, um, you know, that, that photo all the way on the left might, might actually have some Jefferson salamanders in it if the, if the soil is warm enough and the temperatures have been warm enough to actually encourage them out of the, the ground, as Pete said. Cool. Yeah. Do you know where this is taken? I don't. No. Okay. I think a lot of vernal pools look alike, but this one looks familiar. I'll have to follow up with the owner of this vernal pool. Um, great. Cool. So as they breed, uh, we'll go a little bit into what their breeding looks like. And the spotted salamander has fantastic rituals around breeding. Um, males typically arrive to the vernal pool first. Um, and then they swim down to the bottom of the pool and they make a mucus plug and pedestal on the bottom of the, the forest, on the bottom of the vernal pool floor. And they put a tiny packet of sperm on top of that pedestal. And you can actually see uh, that sperm if it's still there with your naked eye. Um, and there might be hundreds, hundreds of these males. And then the females arrive and the males uh, will compete and do like dancing, salamander dancing rituals as they swim uh, to try to catch a female's attention and then direct her towards their sperm pedestal, uh, at which point the female may choose to crawl over the sperm pedestal and accept that sperm to fertilize up to 100 eggs. Uh, and here we have a video, oh my gosh. So this is what that salamander dancing might look like. And you can actually Ooh, see the there's little- there's a newt. Oh yeah. These, there's little white dots in here too, right there. Um, that's this spermatophore that he's talking about. There's one over here too, over here. So these little white dots that are sprinkled around um, beneath the salamanders are all these- um, oh, Yeah. All right for us. <laughs> Thanks to Larry Clarkfeld for this great video. Uh, oh, there goes a uh, back swimmer. Nice. Yeah. Oh my, can we watch that again? Yeah, let's watch that again. Um, so while we're here to talk about North Branch Nature Center's amphibian road crossing program, the vernal pool monitoring program at Vermont Center for Eco Studies is where you might see this, or right across from the road from where you're watching these all migrate. Yeah, the, the amphibians that are crossing the road are, are um, going to a pool to, uh, to do this, basically. And so if you're, if you're um, if the wetland that you're uh, crossing is near, um, is nearby, you can actually maybe see this in, the, um, in your flashlight. And I suspect actually that might be where, where Larry got this uh, yeah. video is just sh shining a flashlight off the road yeah. um, from, from his site. It'd be easier filming it during the day. <laughs> um, and while uh, this is a nice 
progression of what a vernal pool might look like. And it's nice to think of like, okay, the Champlain Valley migration is on. A lot of this is really hyper local. If you have a, a sunny hillside with the southern aspect, you can be in the the, the north is nor, most northerly part of the northeast kingdom um, and already have um, amphibians migrating uh, because they they do really only live in like a quarter quarter mile radius around um, a pond that they return to every year. Uh, the wood frog is one of the first frogs to call in spring. They are really shallow in the soil. They're just ready to thaw out with those first spring rains and get going. And then once they get into the pond, they start uh, they start calling with a duck-like quack. Do you have a good wood frog impression? <laughs> nope. <laughs> All right, I'll, I'll work on mine for next year. Uh, but they're really explosive breeders. The male will hold onto the back of the female. As the female lays eggs, the male um, fertilizes them. And there can be hundreds, up to 700 or more eggs in these egg masses that either float around or are anchored to vegetation. Um, and they're just, they're a sight to see. And often as you uh, see some of these um, wood frogs in particular crossing roads, you come across, you might come across one that's just like absolutely massive, not that big, but uh, very round. And that's probably a female just absolutely full of eggs that's moving into the breeding pool um, ready to uh, lay those eggs. Next, you have the four-toed salamander, which is kind of an exception to these last two, because it uh, doesn't necessarily lay its, it doesn't lay its eggs in pools, but right next to them. Um, amphibians have the, there have been many steps in evolution that have led to different ways to reproduce, um, but Amphibians kind of have a basal trait of needing water, needing humidity for their eggs. That was what fish, that's what fish are still doing today. Uh, but our frog and our spotted salamander are laying their eggs in water so that their eggs can have water um, to reproduce. It's a dangerous place to be an egg in a pool. Um, those beetles and those newts that we saw in uh, the salamander video, they would love to eat frog and salamander eggs. Um, and they have to have all sorts of defenses to that. The four-toed salamander has a different defense. Instead of laying its eggs in water, it lays it next to water in the very, very moist recesses of sphagnum moss. Um, and the female will go into deep, deep into the sphagnum moss and lay just a couple eggs, like a couple dozen uh, or even fewer and then curl up around them and guard them until those eggs hatch. And those little tiny larval salamanders climb out of the moss uh, with their gills and then fall out of the moss and just plop into a pool, a puddle, a pond um, that's hopefully fishless. Um, so yeah, these are almost terrestrially reproducing uh, salamanders, which is really neat. Before we get into migration, this is, I want to address uh, Liza's question here uh, in the chat. Uh, Liza's saying, do the small vernal pools ever freeze up completely after the amphibians lay eggs in them, and does that kill the eggs? And the answer is yes, sometimes. In fact, last year, maybe the year before, uh, in, in our area, and again, as Pete said, this is, a, this is hyper local. So uh, at a couple of the pools that I was visiting, uh, we had um, an early thaw a lot of amphibian migration, uh, a lot of movement, a lot of breeding, and then it, we got a really, really hard freeze um, and that was ex that extended for several days, and the pools froze back up. And uh, many of the uh, once it melted out again, so that we could actually see what was going on. Many of the egg masses um, you could actually see had uh, turned white, uh, which basically meant that they're they're dead. They, the eggs um, all froze. Um, so if the eggs are laid too high in the water. Uh, and they get refrozen, they can definitely kill them. So um, the same is true if you know if the pool dries out too early and the eggs haven't hatched yet. Um, yep, they're they're done for. So these vernal pools are are incredibly sensitive places, um, but it's their sensitivity that makes them um, so so critical to the species that do use them. Yeah, and and the salamanders and frogs they have. Uh... For small animals, they have like quite long lifespans. I'm not sure about uh, wood frog or four-toed salamanders, but I did look up uh, spotted salamanders. They can live up to 20 years. 
uh, or even more. So they have multiple chances uh, for a batch of eggs to work out. Uh, you know, one year it might freeze, the next year uh, the pond might not dry up and fish get big enough to eat all the baby salamanders. Um, but that's why it's so important for us to work to conserve them in this really, really risky um, act of migration to their breeding habitat. Uh, and we'll talk about road and car collisions uh, soon, but like they're also like, we're really excited to see a lot of salamanders and frogs moving in the spring, but so are barred owls, so are, so are solid owls, so are bobcats, raccoons, coyotes, foxes. Um, for all these animals uh, that might uh, dine on salamander and frog, uh, it's an exciting time of year too. So I showed this photo as an example of prime, although maybe a little fishy habitat, uh, but all too often habitat looks like this. As we've uh, developed this land, very often good habitat, uh, you have on the left side of the screen woods, uh, and forests that could support adult salamanders and frogs. And then on the right side, you have a wetland um, that could be breeding habitat. But between them, you have like quite busy road. Um, and I'll say caution now, the next slide will have some squished salamanders on it. Um, so look away now if that's not one, something you wanna see. But yeah, this, might happen on roads and this is what we're really trying to avoid because road crossing mortality just as low as 10 percent can load, lead to the extirpation the local extinction of an amphibian population um, these are relatively long-lived animals um, but yeah 100 eggs might sound like a lot to us uh, but that's not terribly that much like insects and 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 other uh smaller animals are doing thousands and thousands of eggs um, so that, you know, a 10% loss um, is something they could sustain, but that's not necessarily true for um, these larger vertebrates. So that's where we come in, uh, the amphibian road crossing program. Sean, do you want to take it from here? Yeah, sure. Okay. Um, but uh, if anybody has any questions about kind of amphibian ecology before we jump into this part, uh, now's a good time. And I know that a lot of folks join the meeting uh, after we kick things off. And so maybe miss the memo, feel free to use the chat if you have any questions as we go. And at the end, we'll also do another little Q and A. Um, do four toed salamanders mate on land or in water? Ooh. Do you know? I don't know. I don't know. Does anybody else out there know? Throw it in the chat. Um, I think in water, in the pools, and they climb out of the pool and up onto the sphagnum. Um, but uh, I don't know. Let's see. Um, overall, how are the populations doing of the ones you described this evening? We'll we'll uh, touch on that a little bit later, Liza. Do salamanders or their eggs face predation from bullfrogs? That's, you know, that's, that's a great point. Yeah. Um, there's, you know, like the way, as, as Pete said, with like fishy environments, right? Like a fish will eat anything that can fit in its mouth. And that's really the, the same is true of, of, you know, frogs, bullfrogs as well. Um, there's, a, there's a lot of uh, potential predators um, of these salamander larvae and eggs. Salamanders included. Uh, the blue the blue spotted salamander and the Jefferson salamander arrive to ponds, pools so early, they lay their eggs, their eggs hatch, and then their larval hatch salamanders love eating spotted salamander and oh, redback yes. salamander <laughs> and all other sort of salamander eggs. And also the late hatching blue spotted and Jefferson salamander. They're highly cannibalistic. Uh, it's, yeah, I presented it as they're the big fish in a small pond, but I guess more accurate is that some of them are the big fish in a some in a small pond. So when you know when we talk about, as Pete mentioned, you know a spotted salamander laying a hundred eggs, well, you know if one of those makes it to adulthood, um, then then that's a victory, right? And if well, well, I mean in that year, I mean if the thing lives 17, 20 years, <laughs> hopefully it's replacing itself in that amount of time. But you know, it, you know, just a tiny fraction of uh, of those eggs surviving to adulthood is miraculous and a victory. Um, let's see, Nicole asks, how many years do salamanders typically live? Um, it depends on the species. For a spotted salamander and other mole salamanders uh, like them, yeah, 17, 20 plus years. Others are more short-lived. Um, the little red F that you see here um, on the screen, this one 
uh, spends several years in this red F stage. This is actually the F stage of an Eastern newt. And it might live uh, in, in this kind of form for three or four or five years walking around terrestrially before coming back to a pool, metamorphosing into a uh, Eastern newt and then spending the rest of its life entirely uh, in an aquatic environment for another five or 10 years. Yeah, so cool. Um, okay, well, I'm gonna uh, turn our attention over to the, the, the road crossing program and folks are welcome to add more questions to the chat and we'll address them at the end here. So thanks everybody for the conversation. Um, so allow me to rearrange some windows on my end. <clears throat> All right. So, um, so everybody here is hopefully interested in participating in our amphibian road crossing program and actually helping rescue these, these salamanders and frogs and, uh, and being part of this conservation effort here in Vermont. Um, and many of you have done this in the past and thank you very much for, for, uh, for your help and the amphibians, thank you as well. So we, back in 2018 now, or 20, maybe 2017, 2018, we really revamped the, uh, the work that North Branch Nature Center has been doing on rescuing um, frogs and salamanders into a, a little bit more of a robust program with some very clear goals. Um, and so uh, we really have four, four major goals of this amphibian road crossing um, program. One is to increase public engagement in amphibian conservation. That's happening right now. So thank you all for being part of that. Uh, number two is to decrease direct amphibian mortality at road crossing sites. And that's where you all come in. Um, is actually helping steward and shepherd these salamanders and frogs out of the way of car tires. And then collectively, all of our work together and the data that we're going to collect while doing this process is going to help with three and four, inform transportation planning with robust data on movement and mortality at road crossings. I'll touch on that in just a second. And then contributing state biodiversity data to conservation research. So there is, um, there is some, but not a lot of work being done on understanding the distribution and, uh, and movements of uh, amphibians in our region. The uh, Vermont Reptile and Amphibian Atlas has been an awesome resource and has been doing great work for a long time on mapping and understanding populations of amphibians. But, um, but, there, but that, beyond that, there has not really been um, a ton of additional work. And, uh, and so this data that we're collecting is um, really useful, valuable to um, our just understanding of regional biodiversity in general. Um, so our data is being used at multiple different scales at the local level and at kind of like the global level to understand uh, what's happening with amphibian movements. Can I comment on the research? Yeah. Well, we, we talked about how uh, spotted salamander uh, migration, for instance, 95% of it might occur within five days. You can't hire, no research program can hire hundreds of people to go out on like five rainy nights somewhere between March and May. Like no one can afford to do that. Um, what we're trying to do is leverage all of this interest and all of this great direct conservation work to also contribute like just absolutely priceless biological data uh, that isn't really available in any other form. So this is this is exciting stuff. Thanks, Sean. Agreed. Um, so that point in there, that number three, was about uh, providing information directly to um, uh, municipalities about um, amphibian movement. So um, this is a project that is uh, wonderful for being able to make quick local action that can really save the lives of a lot of a lot of um, amphibians, a lot of wildlife all at once. So um, culverts get replaced all the time, um, and oftentimes culverts, the the replacement of those culverts. Um, by, by road crews, by public works departments, um, can be informed by information from local conservation commissions or other interest groups. Uh, and with some slight change in placement or a change in the, uh, the arrangement of the banks on either sides, you can turn a culvert into a nice um, uh, amphibian underpass. Uh, so, um, and other places as well on, on you know, uh, certain portions of the year, towns have actually close roads for the protection of amphibians moving across the road during those times. So whether it be um, road construction or reconstruction projects or whether it be temporary closures, um, folks can make big changes at the municipal level to, to really help their local amphibian populations. Now, this is an example of this happening in practice in Moncton. This is a video by Kylie Briggs. Um, so this video here, um, hopefully it's coming across all right on Zoom. But every frame in this video is, a, is um, like a one minute time lapse um, of 
uh, amphibians moving underneath the underpass that's seen here um, on the left in Moncton. So this was actually designed to uh, keep uh, amphibians and frogs um, or uh, salamanders and frogs out, keeping them from crossing the roadway and instead funneling them towards this protected underpass that can go right underneath. Uh, and you can see just how effective this, this could be. Imagine these this number of amphibians crossing a busy paved highway with lots of traffic, um, bad news. So these are sort of, sort of uh, some of the things that our data, um, that, that our work collectively here together can, um, can help create. So. so this is where you come in. Um, so oh, look at this beautiful underside of this four, uh, four toed salamander here, that great salt and pepper look here. And held by the abdomen. Held by the than abdomen rather than the pinch Ooh. of the tail. Okay, good. Lovely. Um, excellent frog holding technique here displayed on the left. Yep, yep. And then a little pop quiz for which kind of frog this is. You see, we does not have those dorsolateral ridges that run from the eye back to the back leg like the wood frog does. This is our spring peeper, perhaps the most common of the uh, critters that folks find that are Tootsie roll size. Tootsie roll size, like the, the like the trick or treat size tootsie yeah, rolls. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The yeah. <laughs> All right. So let's get into um, how this actually works and what what uh, what we're asking folks to do. So um, the first thing, uh, and I'm going to be going back and forth between a couple of different windows and screens here. So bear with me just a minute as I uh, move some things around. So the the first thing that we ask folks to do is head over to our site which has been designed to be the one-stop shop for everything you need uh, for this uh, road crossing program. So northbranchnaturecenter.org slash amphibian hyphen conservation. You can also find it under nature programs, amphibian conservation. So if you're wondering what to do, what you need, where the resources are, they're all on this page. And um, in 2020, you know, with when, when COVID hit, we actually redesigned this project. So everything was self-sufficient, self-standing, and you can do everything um, right here through this website. And so um, when in doubt, uh, come here and, and follow the steps. But the first thing you'll do is go to the site and we have our uh, volunteer manual and give this manual a read. This will cover most of the stuff that we're talking about tonight. So you'll be well prepared just by, by you know, tonight's program in terms of what to do. But read through this and this will give you um, pointers on the rest of the, um, uh, on a couple other things that we may have missed. Um, and I'll just point out at the bottom of our, of our manual here, our uh, species profiles for every species that you're likely to encounter, spotted salamanders, Jefferson salamanders, blue spotted, spore toads, eastern newts, et cetera, et cetera. So if you want to learn a little bit more about um, amphibian life history and a little species profile, that's at the bottom of the, the manual. But this manual will also go through every, everything we're asking for, collecting data, goals of the project, whatnot. So there's your manual. Um, so um, once you've gone to the website and uh, checked out the volunteer manual of resources, we ask that you then go over to our amphibian crossing map and find yourself a site. And this is where things get really fun. So over here, our amphibian crossing map will bring you to uh, this great interactive map that we have. And you can see that there are sites um, all over Vermont that are um, that wound up on this in one of two ways. Either folks told us that there are amphibians here, and so we added the site to the map, or um, we actually used Google Earth and remote sensing and went around and, and found places where there were forests and wetlands that were bisected by a road, and, um, and knew that, that that type of feature um, is indicative of a potential amphibian road crossing site. So we have sites all over the place. If you live in an area that is not well represented by uh, the dots you're seeing, and you know of places where there's a road that has forests on one side and wetlands on the other, let us know. We will add the site to the map. It's very quick and easy for us to do. So feel free to send us an email and we can add your site to the map. Um, <clears throat> but let's say we live over in Duxbury and we want to go out um, and say, we want to go out to save some salamanders. Um, so we can go and see what sites are in our area. And I see over here, we have uh, this green dot and this yellow dot. Now, these sites come in three flavors, red, yellow, and green. Now, red sites are sites that have do not have any data yet for them. Nobody has been to these sites. We don't know if they are confirmed um, amphibian crossing sites or not. So red sites are a great opportunity if you want to discover a amphibian population um, that no one knows about. These red sites are places for you to potentially go and check out. You might go and be skunked and not find anything, um, but uh, but 
as Pete said, zeros are really important data points. Um, if we visit these sites and we can confirm that, yes, there are indeed no amphibians crossing here, that's a really important thing to know as well. Um, so red sites have no amphibians. Yellow sites are, oh, sorry, red sites have no data. Um, <laughs> yellow sites are sites where um, there have been surveys completed between one and five surveys. So we have a little bit of information on these sites, but we would love to have some more so we can get more robust statistics about what's going on at these sites. Then green sites, these are sites that, um, that have at least six surveys that have been done in the past. So we're, we have a, a pretty robust amount of information. More is, is always better for our purposes with this project, um, but they're not the highest priority in terms of uh, in terms of what we're looking for. We would love to turn this map all green this year. Um, but to reiterate, red, yellow, green uh, does not tell you anything about whether or not there are amphibians there. It tells us about um, whether or not the sites have been surveyed, either no, a little bit, or a lot. So knowing that, let's go into one of these two sites here in, uh, in Duxbury. So as we zoom in, you can see that there is uh, a little pink line that appears next to the dot once you get in a little bit closer. And this shows you the exact transect that we uh, ask you to walk. And, um, and so uh, you'll start at one end and you'll work your way across to the other and we'll explain the, the actual technique here in just a second. But since I'm thinking about it, it's important that if this is your site to not drive across this and park on the other side of it. You wanna park at one side and then walk out and back so that you're not actually moving across um, the site in your car because salamanders and frogs can get easily squished and they're very difficult to see from inside a car on a rainy night. So the other thing that's critical on this map for you all to know is if you click on any one of these dots, it'll actually pop up a little um, info Ooh, box here. This is a good site. This is a good site. Oh, 284. <laughs> So each one of these sites you can click on and pop up a little info box. And these boxes are updated in real time as people submit surveys. This, the data is summarized and represented right here. Um, and so let's say I want to go to this site right here. I can pop it up and I can learn all things, all sorts of things um, about it. Um, first of all, this is the, the, uh, the site number, ARC031. That's going to be important for um, you know, making sure that we know what site you visited. Um, it's been visited five times before. Uh, about three hours of effort have been done here. Uh, this person, Kara, as, as, has, is the uh, champion volunteer that's done the most number of surveys at this site. There's five different species of, of amphibians that have been encountered here. A uh, total number of 284 amphibians encountered in those uh, five surveys, which is great. And 102 amphibians per hour um, and four cars per hour. Now, um, well, actually, let me just finish uh, explaining how, how this pop-up works, and then, and then I'll explain how, how to best choose a site. Um, so you can also see which species have been reported at this site. So at this site, we have spotted salamanders, eastern newts, wood frogs, spring peepers, and other. And other is kind of a catch-all for other things uh, like pickerel frogs or uh, redback salamanders that, um, that you know, are important, but they're not important necessarily to this project because they're not obligate um, like vernal pool breeders. And so their populations are not um, threatened by, uh, road um, by mortality at road crossing sites. Anyway, at the bottom of each one of these, uh, there's actually just directions saying where the transect actually starts and where it actually ends. So from 3285 River Road, west to uh, this gated railroad access road. So that describes where it starts and where it ends. Now, if you're choosing, um, again, if you're choosing which site to go to from um, all your choices here, a couple of important things to keep in mind. Um, safety is always the most important thing, no matter what. Um, and if you are um, a family and you're looking to go out for, uh, to a spot where you and your kids are likely to encounter amphibians, well, you can look at the box, look at the, open the box and see if other stiff amphibians have been reported there before. That'll give you a good idea of what you can expect to find. But make sure you take a look at the, the traffic per hour to get a sense of um, what kind of uh, vehicle traffic you're expecting. And if it's a site that's never been visited before, of course, you're not gonna know um, what the traffic is like. So you can always zoom in on the site or pull it up on Google Maps and figure out if it's a paved road, if it's a back road. This is, yeah, somebody should go here. There's gonna be amphibians here, yeah. Um, so um, choose a site to your liking using the map 
And then, um, and it's always a good idea if you have the time to visit the site during the daytime, uh, because the start and end points can be very difficult to find at night. Remember, we're doing this during mud season at night in the rain on purpose. That's a really difficult time to be driving around on, on, on back roads. And so um, if you have the, the time and wherewithal to visit your site during the daytime, to just figure out where it is, that can actually be really helpful. Um, so um, that's step one. And step two, we talked about this. OK, so the next up is you'll go to your site um, at a prime migration time. Now, again, as Pete mentioned, this is a this is a very localized phenomenon. What's going on in the Northeast Kingdom might be very different than what's happening in central Vermont versus the Champlain Valley. And so the key is if it is dark, if it is raining or has recently rained or otherwise things are very soggy and the road is wet and leaf litter is wet um, and it's above about 40 degrees. What else? Oh, and it's between now and um, early May. These are these are good times to go out. If you look out the window and there's and it's snowing, not going to work. If you look out the window and it's not raining, you're not going to find anything. If you look at the thermometer and it's 20 degrees, or even if it's 32 degrees, you're not going to find anything. If it's June, um, well, you might actually find some some cool like gray tree frogs uh, and some late late species moving back across. But for our purposes, it's dark, it's raining, and it's um, it's well above freezing. <clears throat> um, is going to be a night that you want to go and walk your transect. So you will um, go to the transect, begin walking from one end, and walk at whatever pace you like towards the other. And then you're going to record data on the site conditions and the amphibians that you find. Now, on our website is this uh, data sheet that you can print out and use, or you can just use a notebook and just keep track of these different um, uh, data um, categories of data that we want to collect. Um, and then um, compile them later. And so we'll ask you about how many cars go by, what amphibians you see, whether the road conditions are wet or dry. Um, and um, and these, these surveys are all one-way surveys. And so you're going to move across the, the site, collecting data as you go. When you get to the end of your site, essentially as far away from the car as you're going, that's where the survey stops, and you take out another data sheet and you start a new survey. So these are not out and back transects, they're one-way transects. And that's really important um, for us being able to standardize our data um, it, and uh, for various other reasons, um, just make sure that if you're, you should always be submitting your data in multiples of two, a trip out and a trip back. And if you wanna do laps all night and do 12 laps, that's, that's terrific, uh, but make sure that you know, a, a transect is uh, the one-way um, journey across your site. So as you encounter amphibians, um, you will note what they are, and you will, if they need, uh, if they aren't already towards the edge of the road, you will pick them up and move them across the road um, and give them a hand. Um, as Pete mentioned, move them in the direction that they are already facing. Um, Sometimes if they are, have left the pool and they're trying to go back to the forest and you turn them around and send them back to the pool, that's not really helping them out very much. So make sure you uh, move them across the road in whatever direction that they are pointing. Um, and then if you come across a species that you don't know what it is, uh, take a picture of it with your phone or a camera if, you, if those still exist. <clears throat> and, uh, and if you either don't know what the species is, or it's a particularly rare species, or one that's difficult to identify for anybody, uh, we ask that you to take a photo as well. So that's uh, four-toed salamanders, it's blue-spotted salamanders, and it's anything that's in this Jefferson slash blue-spotted salamander complex. Um, so if again, if you aren't comfortable with identification, if it's a blue-spotted or Jefferson's blue-spotted hybrid, uh, or a photo of salamander, take a photo of that, and there'll be a place to um, submit that photo at the end. <clears throat> um, you may come across um, amphibians that have been hit by cars, unfortunately, and it's also really important to move those amphibians off the road. <clears throat> There's two reasons for it. One is uh, so that 
those dead amphibians don't attract other predators onto the road, things like foxes and raccoons and whatever, they may be coming looking to, to feed on those. Um, move, uh, get the, the, the dead amphibians off the road, well off the road to protect them. And also to make sure that you're not double counting that. So if you go out and you come back, you're not double counting the same uh, dead amphibians. So, uh, and also if a group comes to the site, you know, an hour after you've left, they're not gonna count the same dead amphibians that you came across. Um, so these data sheets, we have um, some at the Nature Center that are actually printed on uh, waterproof right in the rain paper. And so if you are interested and live in the area and want to swing by the Nature Center, we can give you a couple of copies of this data sheet uh, so you can actually write in the rain with it. Zach, where are the rain conditions right now? What? How you describe <laughs> that? Downpour. Okay, that sounds about right. <laughs> um, right in the rain notebooks are, are, uh, are a really handy tool for those in the trade here. Um, but again, you don't need one of our data sheets. You don't need a fancy uh, right in the rain version of it. All you need to do is know what fields you're collecting and make sure that you're prepared to enter that data when you get back home, uh, which we'll talk about in a second. We'll talk about it right now. Um, so once you are uh, back in your car or safely back home and you, you've rung up yourself and are nice and dry, uh, you can go to back to our website and there's an online data entry portal where you can submit the data that you found. So you'll just submit um, the information. This is all in the exact same order as on the data sheet. Uh, all the same information. You can just plug in your information from the uh, data sheet and um, hit submit. And that is how you get your data to us. Um, there is uh, one thing that I like to do if you're if you're tech savvy and have a waterproof phone uh, is you can actually just pull up the website um, on your phone and save it as a icon to your uh, your home screen on your phone. And that way you can actually just pull it, pull this up um, in the field and, and type the data in right when you know right from under an umbrella or at your car or whatever. So that can be handy too. But we ask that everybody submit your data through the online portal once you get home. Um, we've worked really hard over the last few years to try to make this process as simple and streamlined as possible, collecting the least amount of types of information as necessary so that, um, so that all of you can spend the maximum amount of time playing with uh, respectfully playing with amphibians um, and enjoying wildlife encounters and the least amount of time uh, dealing with data sheets and all of that sort of thing. So trust us, this is, uh, is about as simple as it gets in terms of data collection and entry, and we thank you all for your attention and in, uh, in submitting that. And then once you've done so, you can congratulate yourself because you've helped amphibians at your site and across Vermont. So let's talk a little bit about how to do this uh, safely. This is again, the most important part of, of the whole process is making sure that we are safe and making sure that the amphibians are safe in this process. So first let's talk about the amphibians. So first you wanna make sure that you have clean, uh, clean hands that are wet and that you keep your hands low to the ground. Oh, Pete has a good demonstration here. <laughs> so, so Pete is, is, uh, is demonstrating the salamander, uh, salamander hold. That's the salamander hold. This would be the frog hold. Over the top. Um, so clean hands. Now, some of you might think, okay, I'll just throw some hand sanitizer in my backpack when I go out. Um, it's really important that you do not use hand sanitizer. Clean means clean of oils and debris and, uh, and you know, any kind of um, fragrances or sunscreens or certainly bug sprays or anything like that. You want to make sure your hands are nice and clean. They can be muddy. They can be wet with um, snow and, and leaf litter and anything from nature is fine, but make sure there's nothing on your hands uh, in that is that is man-made because again these these animals they breathe through their skin and they absorb chemicals through their skin um, and so it's really important that our hands are clean so that we can keep them safe. Uh, if you have uh, rubber gloves or nitrile gloves that can be a, a great thing to put on as well. And then uh, keep your hands low to the ground so that if it does if a frog does make it out through your hands or the salamander jumps off it only has to fall a couple of inches rather than a few feet. Um, and then only handle them when it's necessary to do so. 
if the amphibian is not moving very fast on its own, or if it's in the middle of the road, um, you can give it a hand across. But if it's already nearly at the end of the road, then um, then you then just let it be, and it'll it'll work its way across. Um, now, as for keeping you safe, um, make sure you have lots of flashlights, bright flashlights with extra batteries. Um, make sure you're wearing reflective vests um, and other bright clothing. Uh, remember. This is, you know, in the dark when it's raining hard in mud season. Uh, this is a really difficult time of year for, for motorists to be able to, to see you. And so you want to give them all the help they can to make sure that you are, that they're aware of your presence and you are nowhere near where they're driving. Um, so um, we often put up uh, salamander crossing signs uh, when we're out there. Not so much to alert motorists to the presence of salamanders, but to alert them to the fact that you are there um, in the roadway up ahead. And so our, <clears throat> when we make signs, we often say, you know, there are re research in progress or people in the road ahead or something to that effect. So warn drivers that you're going to be up there. Uh, another note on uh, motorist safety. These, the folks in this fo uh, photo are doing a really good job of uh, flashlight etiquette. Um, if you do see a car, maybe like look over at the car with your headlamp, but then direct your flashlights, direct your, your headlamps onto yourself so that you're lit up. You're not blinding the driver. You're just showing that you are there uh, and you're really visible. Yep. And of course, step completely off of the road, not just to the edge of the road, but step as far off road as you can. And so uh, be mindful if you have a site that has a wetland on one side that you step, go to the forested side and walk uphill. So you're not, uh, you're not um pushed you know you're not um the, you, know, you have a place to escape to if a, if a car is, is coming by uh raincoat rain pants waterproof boots um all pretty obvious uh bring a camera or a smartphone that takes uh decent pictures in case you encounter something that you need help identifying or something that we want a photo of um carry a spatula that you don't intend to ever use again for anything else so i have a spatula in the console of my truck for this purpose for picking up, scooping up dead amphibians and, and moving them off the road. And you know you can either walk them into the woods and set it down, or you can uh, kind of do the fling disperse method, um, whatever you're comfortable with. But the key is um, removing it far from the road. Better leverage with a long-handled spatula. Better leverage, ethically questionable, but um, uh, say clean bucket here. Uh, you can bring a bucket or even a little Tupperware. Sometimes if you have uh, a salamander or frog that you want to spend a little bit more time with, you can put some leaf litter into a Tupperware, into a bucket, and you can put the, uh, the amphibian in, in that. And that way you can enjoy it with yourself or your kids uh, for a little while, take pictures, um, but you're not handling it too long. You're not exposing it to any, any risk or anything. Um, and also sometimes at some sites, there are so many um, amphibians moving, peepers and wood frogs, that you really do need a bucket to get them all into so you can then move a batch of them off of the road at once. Um, so if you're at a site like that, congratulations. Um, but uh, yeah, having something that you can kind of put things in can be helpful. Data shooting clipboard and protocol manual back in the car, all good ideas. So let's uh, watch some good technique here. So we have a volunteer wearing rubber gloves wearing a headlamp, also holding a flashlight with a reflective vest, uh, nice muck boots on, <clears throat> full rain gear. Um, and we have a spotted salamander in the middle of the road. I'm gonna pick it up carefully in one hand. Now, technique could be improved by having a second hand uh, and using both hands here, although the other hand has a flashlight in it. And uh, she's crouching low to the ground as low as she comfortably can while moving this amphibian out of the road in the direction that it, whoops, in the direction that it came from. Or I should say in the direction that it was moving. Walking entirely across the road and then depositing it on the other side of that tall oh snowbank. Um, Amphibians have a really hard time scaling steep walls like snowbanks and um, road grades. And so help it out by putting it on the opposite side of that snowy, salty bank there. Um, so uh, if you, again, if you were, have been part of this project in the past, thank you. If you're just joining the ranks now, thank you. 
uh, in this last year, we completed 220 surveys of, I think, 90 or 100 sites, like 130 sites. I can't remember off the top of my head. Um, but uh, 539 of you were involved in the project, spending 330 hours um, out there in the rain with the amphibians, rescuing 5,382 amphibians uh, just last year alone. And uh, Pete, what is that last? Uh, yeah, about? so this was, uh, it's the amphibian migration season is kind of funny because it's largely dependent on rain when they, they migrate. And last year, we didn't, 5,382 isn't a record year for us. Uh, and it wasn't that there were fewer amphibians, it's just that the rain happened at like, 3 and 4 a.m. and many, many of us uh, were in bed at that point. So the average precipitation, uh, if you go back to the data sheet, oh, way, way back, um, you can see that the data sheet has rain, check one, from zero to four. Uh, the average for last year was a 1.26. Um, I'd really hope for rain to be, you know, somewhere between a two and a three something between rain and heavy rain this year. Um, so last year when people did manage to get out um, in the earlier hours, you know, like after dark to like midnight when a lot of sensible people choose to go out in the cold and the rain and the wet uh, to look for amphibians, it just wasn't that rainy last year. And that's why we had fewer salamanders and frogs, I think, than uh, in years past. Okay. Um, so um, with that, um, we'll say get signed up, head over to our website to uh, join the mailing list. Um, although again, we've designed this in such a way that um, we are here to help you, but all the resources that you need are available there. Um, so that if you're a, you know, a self-starter, a go-getter, everything you need is right there to answer all your questions. Um, but we're here for you. And then, you know, next time it's a rainy night, get out there and uh, things are, if they're not on the move already, they shall be within the week, I would think, uh, especially with all these warm temperatures coming up. Um, so uh, now's a good time, folks, to throw questions in the chat if you have them. I'm going to stop the screen share. And I actually want to just hit a couple of um, Q&As, uh, like a really common Q&As that we often get. Um, let's see. While I move around all the... So again, folks um, often ask us, um, one moment, folks. Okay, how do I unhighlight this person? There we go. Thanks. We pin, aha. Ta -da! Okay, um, so uh, folks often ask us, yeah, are salamanders and frogs moving tonight? And the answer is, we don't know what's happening at your house right now. Um, so remember, if it's above freezing, if it's dark, and if it's raining, um, and it's between now and the beginning of May or so, um, then odds are the answer is yes. Um, so uh, other qu another question that we often get is, we went out to a site, <clears throat> we surveyed it, we didn't find anything. Do you still want our data? And the answer is absolutely yes. As Pete said, zeros are a very important number in conservation science. Uh, it is really, really helpful um, to make sure that we have, uh, that if you did not find anything, that you still submit the data form just the same. It'll tell us, um, you know, a, a lot of information about, you know, traffic. It'll tell us about um, the fact that there were not amphibians there at that time of year. Um, but it'll also make sure that folks in the future don't go to that site um, if there weren't amphibians seen there. So uh, again, a lot of these sites in our map are hypotheticals. And so if you don't find anything, um, please do submit that information to us as well. Um, another common question we get is, can I just combine all of our site, all of our information from the entire night onto one data sheet? Um, we were there for an hour and a half and, and you know, walked the transect seven times. Can we just combine all that? And the answer is unfortunately not. Every transect should be a one-way um, journey across your, your site. Now, if you wanna take a break for a couple laps and just not worry about entering data, that's fine. Um, you know, if you've done a couple, you know, a lap or two and you, you've, you've submitted 
you know, you have data sheets for, for a couple of uh, sessions and you want to just get out there and, and, you know, continue working with the amphibians and not have to worry about the collecting data, that's fine. Um, we'd much rather have, you know, a little bit of data that's submitted in the correct format than a whole bunch of compiled data that doesn't really mesh well with the, with the rest of our system. So keep that in mind. Um, let's see. Uh, folks often ask us, what species is this? Uh, and send us a photo, and we love that. Um, so please do email us any photos that you have. There's a there's a uh, submit photo submission portal on the website where you can actually upload photos of what you found out there if you're not sure. Um, so we're happy to help you with that. Remember, the bottom of the manual has species profiles that uh, kind of gives you a little identification tips and life history strategies for each of these species that you're likely to encounter. Unfortunately, most most of the species um, are pretty easy to tell apart with with just a couple of exceptions and it's the exceptions that we want photos for anyway so um and then the last common q a that i just want to touch on is in the past several years ago we asked folks to adopt a site and they like claim that site for the year um you, there's no need to adopt a site you can go wherever you want um you can go to the same site five times you can go to five different sites you, you can do whatever you can pick whatever your site you'd like to using the, the map as your resource and as your guide um, so no need to adopt a site if, if you've uh, had experience doing that in past years so um anything else Pete? uh i just saw a couple in the chat uh, molly's asking if we recommend returning to a site repeatedly the first few times there's warm rain to gather as much data as possible um uh, do what you want i think that's really great though because uh, that continued effort at the same site um, is really uh, could, pr could provide some really cool ecological insight. Um, knowing when they're there and when they're not is awesome. And being able to capture the start and end would be really, really cool. Um, someone was asking if there's a place where there's free reflective gear. Um, mm -hmm. That's something, uh, yes, the answer is yes. We have some that we can lend at North Branch. Um, I know libraries that have it. I know conservation commissions that have it. So if you go to those local groups, you can ask those places if they have uh, reflective reflective gear for this project. Um, and if they don't, uh, ask them to get some. Um, and a lot of, uh, we're doing talks like this for conservation commissions and libraries and um, environmental education places throughout the state. And a lot of these community hubs are trying to get uh, equipment like that to support this sort of work um, and the safety of their community members. Um, if I, you can I go, go ahead. a couple of, so first of all, I'm going to throw um, our emails into the chat here. Um, if you, somebody was asking about uh, if there's a site that you go to that isn't on our map, what, what do we do? Um, uh, email us and um, there's actually on our website, um, there's actually a place. Um, on the website, there's actually a spot here, report a new amphibian road cost. And you can go here and you can actually fill out this form uh, with their contact information and, and fill out information on where that site is. And uh, with that, we can actually then just make a new uh, crossing site and that dot will get added right to the map, and then you'll have a, a you know an arc site number that you can just um, you know start submitting data for. Um, if you yeah, so that that's the best way, um, and we can turn that around pretty quickly. So so please do um, send us your sites. Um, so let's see. I'm gonna go back up to the top of the questions list, and we'll go go down on here. In the meantime, I saw one asking about uh, tips on picking up a frog. Um, so frogs are hot, they're very mobile. Uh, sometimes it's the case that you can just walk behind them and herd them across the road. Uh, if you are trying to catch a frog, I and it's evading you, I uh, recommend the cup-shaped hand and a gentle around the frog, especially in front of the frog. They will hop up and forward. Uh, and if you can get your hand in front of that, you can get them on the road and then bring a hand underneath um, for a good frog holding technique across the road. And if you are, uh, if if you're, if the frog continues to evade you, you can always use a Tupperware upside down and uh, and try to, you know, scooch a piece of cardboard or plastic or something like that underneath it to move it across that way. Uh, Siri is saying, I live in a dirt road and I have seen amphibians in the past. There are no site codes that have been surveyed where I live. So that's a great example. You should email us with where that site is and we'll get it on the map um, for you. 
or tell your friends if there are sites around that haven't been surveyed. Let's get yeah. more people out. Uh, let's see, Liza. Oh, um, Elizabeth, uh, Elizabeth Copeland saying we used our flashing red bike lights as well. That's a great, yeah, red red flashing lights are great um, to put on yourself. Uh, Liza saying, is this program open to anyone anywhere in Vermont? Absolutely, yes. In fact, there's even some sites over across the Connecticut River in New Hampshire at this point. Um, just be, so yeah, if you live anywhere in the state, whether you have crossing sites on the map or not, um, we'd be happy to add some sites to your area if you know of some good places. Otherwise, if you live near where some sites are on the map, then um, then have at it. Um, returning that reflect, returning to the reflective vest uh, question by Nicole. Um, yeah, if you happen to live near North Branch Nature Center. Um, we have a couple dozen uh, reflective vests, just like the one I'm wearing, um, that we can that we can loan you for the season. So uh, just shoot us an email, and we can arrange that for you. I also know the Hartford Conservation Commission and the Cornwall Conservation Commission and some of the Mad River Valley libraries uh, have these reflective vests. You can call it if if those organizations don't have them. Often uh, the like Public Works Commission and the road crews in your town will will have. We'll have them and they might even like we got ours because they were they were donated from a, a local um public works department that had a ton of extra ones that they were trying to get rid of so you can try that all right let's see um elizabeth is uh i'm not going to read elizabeth's question out fully but i'm going to remind me uh to mention that let me share my screen Um, so when you zoom in on a site on the map, we have that purple line, right, where the transect starts and the, which, where the transect stops. Now, it might very well be that all the amphibians are really just moving within a hundred yards of this eighth of a mile or quarter mile long uh, walk here. Um, and so it's important to, uh, to walk the entire transect so that we can, we can learn where the, the, uh, where the amphibians are actually moving. But if we have several surveys that are happening and we have several reports of folks saying, hey, I walked the whole site, but I just want you to know that the only place where amphibians are going to be crossing is this you know, couple hundred yard stretch here. We can, we can change the, uh, the purple line here. We can change the, the transect. So if you have experience with the site and you'd like us to shorten it or in, uh, uh, in your case, lengthen the site uh, because you know there's crossing just beyond it, um, let us know. And, and we can we can modify these again. A lot of these are kind of hypotheticals. Um, this one happens to not be. Uh, let's see, there is several species seen here: spring peepers, redback salamanders. Anywho, great question. Um, Kaylee's asking to report a new crossing site. How many amphibians? Number of species crossing there is ideal to have it be considered. Uh, if you've seen anything crossing at all, that's one of the species that, that we are focusing on, spring peepers, wood frogs, spotted salamanders, et cetera. Um, let us know and we'll add it to the site. Um, there's no kind of minimum requirements of what, what you have, what you need to see for it to be considered. If you've seen amphibians there of any sort, we'll add it to the, to the site. And that way we can learn more about it um, as folks visit that and turn up more information about it. I guess the minimum requirement would be one. One, yeah. <laughs> or actually, not necessarily. If there's a site that you're driving by during the day and you're like, oh, sure. this is a spot where there's a wetland on this side and there's a road on this side, and I bet you all would really like to, if you have a hunch that it's a good crossing site, then we can put that on the map for you. So we've, did, we, we've done the best we can in the areas where we've been working to do remote sensing to find some of these. But Vermont's a big place for a couple of people to do this work. So. Um, let's see if there's any other questions in here that we missed. It turns out that vernal pool puddles, glorified puddles in the woods, uh, don't actually show up that well on satellite maps. Uh, Emma's asking, does it matter which side of the road you walk on, the wood side versus the wetland side? So that's a great point um, and something I should have mentioned. You want to be covering the entire road as you walk. So I usually walk right down the center of the road and I sweep my flashlight from one side to the other as I'm walking. Now I do it slowly because these, these amphibians will blend into a dirt road really well. So be watching where you step, <clears throat> make sure your flashlights are bright because um, a dim flashlight won't work very well. Your cell phone light is not bright enough uh, to see what's going on. But walk down the middle of the road, scan the entire width of the road. Um, 
And again, check out our manual before you go out for the first night so that you can pick up a couple more tips about exactly how this survey protocol will work because naturally we've probably forgotten a couple of things in our, in our talk tonight, but that's why the manual is there for you. Um, I wanna go back to Molly's question about should we return to a site repeatedly for the first few warm rainy nights? Um, I am remembering that a couple of years ago, some folks visited a site where it was a known crossing site, but they didn't find anything. And, it was, and we looked at the data sheet afterwards and it's because it was actually snowing at the time. Uh, so it was just too early for that particular site. So um, if, if you're at that site and you don't see anything and uh, it could just be because it's, it's too early in the year and it needs another another visit. That's why we want to make sure that we're getting at least five or six or more visits to every site before we really call something as uh, you know definitely not a crossing site. Or um, from from a conservation standpoint too, if you go one time, if you go to a, a spot that had a, a a really healthy salamander and frog population, and you go one night and you don't see anything. Well, maybe that's a fluke. Maybe the weather wasn't right. Maybe they all migrated already. But if you go there every couple nights or every night for a long time, uh, that's a really believable zero. That's a zero that we know, like, oh, they didn't migrate. Like, we missed it. Um, and like that can really call into question, like, what's going on in this in this pond in this pool. Um, Kate is mentioning that um, this site. Arc 74 is a busy strip of Route 14 where traffic moves 50 miles an hour plus, not a safe spot to walk in the road. Yeah, there are spots on our map that are really not, not well suited for most people. And, and there's a spot by the Wrightsville Reservoir that's a, that's a site that has never been surveyed. Yeah. And that's because I've gone to survey it and said, I'm not gonna get out of the car here. Um, so, you know, again, this is, you know, use your judgment, be really safe. And uh, if, if it's not a safe place to survey, if there's too much traffic, if it's, or if the traffic is fast moving, don't put yourself at risk um, and, uh, and pick another, pick another site and let us know. So thank you, Kate. I will, um, I will make a note of that and, uh, and we'll actually put that in the description of the site saying, you know, FYI, this is high speed traffic. So feel free to um, send information to us so that we can update our records to better make sure that everybody else knows what they're getting into. Uh, Liza's asking, is there an ideal group size? Um, there, there's no ideal group size. It's good to have more than one person, um, again, for safety, but also because it's really difficult to actually find all the amphibians in the road sometimes. So having multiple eyes with multiple flashlights is really helpful. Um, you want to make sure that you are traveling together as a group and you're finding these things together and that you're not sp spread out over several hundred yards. Um, the, uh, the surveys here are set up so that you're, you're moving, however big your group is, your group is traveling together and encountering these amphibians uh, together. Beyond that, it doesn't matter how many people you have. Um, you know, eight people can enjoy the same spotted salamander just fine. Uh, so there's no, no limit to how many people you can bring. Just make sure you're, you're uh, doing it safely and everybody has lights and reflective gear and all that. All right, if we're missing somebody's question, put it back in the chat for us, because I think that is probably, I think that's all the ones I'm seeing. I don't know, Pete, if you've seen any others that we've missed. Um, no, I don't think so. Okay. Any other questions, folks? Super. Well, everybody, thank you so much for spending the evening with us and the amphibians. Thank you for helping them out this season. Uh, and uh, on behalf of the Nature Center, we thank you for um, contributing to this project. We really appreciate your time um, and your data and your attention to detail and submitting it. And please reach out to us if you have any questions or concerns as the season gets underway. And the next time there's a rainy night in the forecast in your area, um, Good luck. Okay. All right. Have a good night, everybody.